Yes, we can. Cool. All right, let me get my timer up. Um, <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, Sorry. Three things in this speech. Firstly, framing what the power of these religious figures and institutions actually are. Secondly, explaining why in both cases, that is in cases where the religion is like not supported by the state and in cases where the religion does support the authoritarian regime, why in both of those cases, we're, at, we're able to get these people on side. And then finally listing off bunch of impacts as to why getting these religious figures on site actually helps the movement in terms of um, buy-in, etc. So before I get into that, just the mechanism, I think the way this works is that like these protest movements are going to do things like encourage these religious figures to speak um, at their, you know, broader like protests, etc. They're going to encourage them to like speak, give sermons and so on about the protests and about how bad the authoritarian regime is within their particular institution, so like within the church or within the mosque, for instance, and also on their bigger protests, they're going to encourage the main like imams or like priests to come and speak at those areas. You're essentially going to tie themselves to some extent to this religious group, um, and that's kind of what we stand behind on our side. Okay, on the first thing, what the power of these religious figures and institutions actually are. We think the power of these figures is, is really important. We think that these figures are seen as having epistemic access to God, right? Particularly in like with priests, for instance, they're seen as having a direct connection with God. And so if, therefore the thing they say is an interpretation for religious people of what actually God wants them to do. So we think that these figures have massive amounts of power over the people that actually subscribe to their religion in the first place, given that they're seen as having this you know unique access to God, which normal people lack. There's that sense of like the divine actually supporting your protest movement against this um, authoritarian regime, which we think is really important. But the second thing is the fact that religion itself is really important to, is really open to interpretation, right? So the Bible or the Quran has loads of different interpretations to it. And these religious figures are really important in doing that, which means that they have unique like knowledge, which they can then transmit down. So if they say this is the correct interpretation and the interpretation of our religious text means that we should take down this leader because he goes against our values, then people will follow it. Thirdly, it's just like the importance that religion has in people's lives, right? It's one of their most deeply held beliefs. It's the most personal thing to them. It, it forms how they make their decisions and so on. So at the point at which we get, get gain these figures on side, these figures who control how this religion is interpreted and have this seen as having this link to God, we think that then you're better able to convince those people to come to our side. That's the power that these groups have. Yeah, so as I said in my setup, there are two possible cases. One where the religion is like kind of repressed or at least not supported by the government. And secondly, where the authoritarian regime is supported by religion itself. I think in both of those cases, we have the ability to get these religious leaders on side. How is that the case? We think for, firstly, obviously in the case where the religion is to some degree being repressed, like you, or at least not, or at least this government isn't actively supporting the religion, then you it's really obviously easy to get them on side, right? Because if you're a protest movement and you're protesting against like this communist government that doesn't like religion anyway, it's very easy for you to get these priests and church members on side. This is what happened with Lech Walesa in Poland, where he managed to get the Catholic church to massively support him to overthrow the communist regime, right? Because they had a direct interest in seeing that regime overthrown. So they were then able to practice more openly um, in public. And crucially, even if the state tries to repress the religion, the religion can never fully be repressed because the whole point of religion is that it's a set of beliefs that people have internally. And no matter how repressive a state is, like those beliefs are still held internally by those people. You can't like brainwash enough people out of it, which means that these figures still have power, even in the case where the state, like the authoritarian regime isn't actively supported by them. But secondly, in the cases where the religion does actually work with the state, we still think you're quite likely to get some elements of that religion on side. Firstly, because you can target specific members of like specific religious leaders within that group. Even if the overall religion supports the um, state, you can get a particular cardinal or whatever on side. And crucially, this is links back to what I was saying before about there being different interpretations of religion, right? Which means that even if 
the some elements of that religion support the state you can get other different elements within that religion to actually support you you can appeal to them to these religious leaders and these institutions on the basis of values you can say this authoritarian regime doesn't support egalitarianism which is a key value in the quran and actually that's what our protest movement is all about so you can get them on side by appealing to their values but also crucially i think you can get these religious leaders on side by just appealing to their self-interest you can say like in the if we get you on our side and in the instances where we're actually successful you're going to have this even greater power and you're actually going to be able to preach these people and given that some of these figures might be self-interested you can appeal to them on those grounds okay why does getting these people on on your side actually massively help with the movement before that i'll take up uh, someone i'll take closing if they have one yeah what what sort of resources or influence do you think these movements have to genuinely recruit powerful religious leaders look i i think part of this debate is acknowledging that like the, the the movement has to be able to in order to have the debate but also i think they can easily do this they can easily like go to these you know send stuff to these members or whatever appeal to them like attend their sermons and so on and ask them to help out or just like meet them in person like these can be quite big movements and have a lot of traction so for instance the muslim brotherhood is, as an example of that okay so why is getting these people on side really good for the movement firstly and most obviously it's buy-in you get people coming in from the religious group and who are being led by the religious leader remember the analysis i gave right at the start on the power that these religious leaders have to actually influence people this is the mechanism through which protest movements in mexico and uruguay were able to successfully overthrow their autocratic regimes but secondly we think that the protest movement is now done in terms that people understand so for instance you're no longer doing your protest movement in like Western terms of like rights, human rights, or whatever, but you're doing it if you're in Iran, for instance, in terms of the Quran itself. And that's something that more people, if it's a religious country, actually understand compared to the more Western terms. To the point where you have some religious leaders giving these sermons, even in the first instance, we think that means that people are more broadly able um, to understand it. Thirdly, it means that in instances where the state is supported by the some elements of the religion, we think the state no longer has a monopoly over religious understanding. That's what Zoya ul Haq had in Pakistan, which enabled him to have massive power. We think that now these religious movements are able to challenge that narrative um, to some extent once they get these religious, some elements of these religious leaders on side. And finally, we think it's much harder to repress once you have religious members on side. And this is also what I was saying before about like, it's impossible to completely eradicate religion, even if it's repressed, because it goes down to the deeply held beliefs that someone internally has, that's impossible to get rid of. Crucially though, this religious group of people who you get on side now is a group who you lacked access to beforehand because you didn't have, you couldn't go to them in their own terms. On the, on the other hand, the secular group of people who opposition might talk about as being alienated probably won't be because they want to overthrow the regime on both sides of the house. Now you're just getting an additional group of people, namely religious people on side, and that greater buy-in enables you to have bigger protests, enables you to more effectively resist the police and so on, which enables you to overthrow the regime. For all those reasons, so proud to propose. I'd like to thank the speaker very much for the speech and I'd like to call upon the first speaker for the opposition. We want to be absolutely clear. This debate is about protest movements and exactly what benefits are most um, possible and greatest for them. What are the interests of protest movements? First, we think it's about staying true. Obviously, look, no. Firstly, it's obviously about overthrowing the authoritarian regime. Secondly, it's obviously also about protecting their own values and what they stand for. And third, it's about installing a good, sustainable regime that is in line with their values after the authoritarian regime is overthrown. This is very important to keep in mind because I feel that government hasn't been keeping to this very much. They can't just say that, oh, you know, we won in like Poland, we won in Uruguay because of the religious figures without A, giving us any explanation as to like the specific circumstances in which these people won. And I think it's incredibly reductionist to claim that they only won because of the religious figures and the institutions. And if it weren't for them, they weren't able to win. I think it's demeaning to the other factors and the other forces that enable this uh, these protests to be successful in the first place. And we, we are going to contend on opposition that it wasn't it was in spite of and not because of religious groups and figures and institutions that existed within it also we're going to suggest um 
how this creates more harms later on. Let me just move on on some quick points of rebuttals and then integrate the rest of them into my arguments. First, they say we, we get larger and stronger support because, you know, like people are more emotional and they can support it more. Actually, I'm going to uh, rebut this in my, in my arguments later. And uh, but I want to rebut this one thing that they say, which is that they have lots of power given them to them by God and their unique access to God and like some kind of divine support, which lends greater support to the protest movement. Hang on. The fact that these people have a lot of power given to them by God and some kind of divine authority sounds eerily similar to authoritarian regimes. This means authoritarian regimes are always um, most more often than not like prop themselves up with the whole idea that like oh you know like I'm sent here by God and like that's why I'm more holier than you and we think that's a harmful mentality to have and we don't think it's something that protest groups should be standing for in the first place and that is why we think supporting religious figures and institutions is so antithetical to the very system of divine birthright that they're seeking to overthrow in the form of the authoritarian government rather we think they should be supporting a more democratic form of self-election and that not one person is divinely ordained but like multiple people to decide like what is the best um, um what is the best like governor for them in terms of like a political process we think it's extremely antithetic uh, uh, disingenuous for them to suggest that they want to support the divine right to authority while trying to like overthrow authoritarian regimes now i'm going to move on to my arguments and like weave in my rebuttals in here First, I'm going to say how it's bad that religious and figures institutions get involved because we think religious practices are rarely homogenous. This means that you risk alienating a large source of people. So they say, like, you know, people are very, very emotional. You want to get into their hearts and minds. Like, yeah, that's true. But also if you get into their hearts and minds and you get on the wrong side of their hearts and minds, and let's say you're promoting, like the Dalai Lama comes and endorses your regime in Thailand or like Myanmar, for instance, but you're like a Christian Karen living in Myanmar. Myanmar is very diverse, by the way. So they're like, you know, a ton of like almost as equal number of Muslims as they are like Buddhists and Christians as well. So that's terrible. Precisely because it's so personal, these uh, important support bases that otherwise would have supported your regime in the first place get alienated. This means that what was once political support turns into religious souring and bitter feuds and infighting within the, the protest itself. That's terrible. Secondly, we think that we lose mechanisms to protest. Often religious groups have their own like laws and like um doctrines that prevent them from doing things like violent protests. We think this means that they're severely inhibited. For instance, if the, um, for example, Buddhism is like very anti-violence and if the protest groups need to employ like civil disobedience or like things like that, a Christian group might oppose. And that's why we think you lose a lot of important mechanisms to protest and that's terrible just because it limits your practical ability to protest the authoritarian regime because of all these like laws and additional restrictions that are imposed on you. Third argument, though we think the religion as a whole might be in line of the government, we think religious institutions and Figures often are the ones that propped up the government in the first place. We see this in the case of how the Catholic Church, for instance, supports like the Filipino government and like its authoritarian regime, or in like you know other countries as well. So we think you risk reneging on their own values, um, or uh, where the religious groups tend to be conservative and in line with the government, and you risk compromising the movement with concessions to them. And it's really terrible because you're basically like supporting the authoritarian regime while at the same time seeking to overthrow it simply because these religious groups like already operate like covertly under um, the covers with these um, authoritarian regime in the first place. Just look at how the Buddhist Sangha is very tight to the military regime in Thailand. But the a fourth most important argument that we want to make is that this is exposing the protest to more harm. That means it's more easy to get shut down by the authoritarian government. Why? Because we think, so as they say, like, you know, you pin all your hopes on this, like one guy, like the Dalai Lama, or, like the Pope or whatever, which is great. But look, if it makes it easier to moralize people by one figurehead, it also makes it easier to demoralize and defeat you by torturing these people, by putting their heads on sticks and parading them around the city. The same thing that moralizes everyone is also their greatest vulnerability and weakness. We think it's terrible to peg your entire regime or like your entire protest to one guy or like one religious institution, because once that collapses and is held under extreme scrutiny, it increases the vulnerability of the whole protest in general. My fifth argument is um, how it's terrible that in terms of succession in the future. We argue how protest groups generally tend to be very interested in increasing the amount of, um, increasing the stability and democracy of that regime after the authoritarian regime is overthrown. However, if successful, you risk replacing the authoritarian regime with a theocratic one. They already suggested that these people have a divine right to authority and power. So what's not gonna suggest that they're going to want to promote their own ideals. In fact, 
This is even more likely given that religious groups only agree to join hands with the movement if they're given certain concessions or certain promises, like a seat in the parliament, which could lead to like 10 seats in the parliament and eventually an overthrow of it. Because religious groups always want to promote their own ideals and spread their sphere of influence by definition because they, view, they feel that they are God ordained and that their way of being in the world is correct. And that is why it's harmful to a more sustainable and stable regime later on. My sixth argument is that it's incredibly bad simply because they're of the um uh, because it, of like it religious on their own values and the reluctance of the religious figures to participate in also might create more friction in terms of um, undermining confidence in the regime as well. Now we know that we on the on the on the point about like you know transitioning to a less stable government. Modern Poland has a lot of issues with relig religious extremism as well. So their very own example shows how one authoritarian regime overthrown by the Catholic Church could cause massive protests because of the overturning of like abortion and currently threatening to slide Poland back into authoritarianism. We we think religious groups only create more propensity for these um, authoritarian regimes ar arising again in the future because of their very nature. So not only is it harmful to the protest, it's harmful to the values of the protest, it's harmful to the goals of the protest to install a long-term stable regime, and that is why in the both short and long run, in the small scale and the large scale, we win on the side of the opening opposition. I'd, li <clears throat> I'd like to thank the speaker very much for the speech. And now I'd like to call upon the second speaker for the government. Cool. Am I audible? You are. All right. Awesome. Give me one second. I'll get the camera out. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, I'm going to start. In... Oh, before I start, sorry. Uh, I prefer if you ask me POIs, uh, not in chat, but actually shout them out. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm one of those. All right, anyway, uh, I'm gonna start in three, two, one. Here's why opening opposition has already lost this debate, right? Every single argument that they've made is talking about the harms of what they conception, and we'll talk, I'll talk about that in a second, but the harms of religious movements and religious figures without actually drawing an actual comparative picture. They don't actually provide you a mechanism of how these protest movements can succeed in the first place, right? I mean, the first thing, the first challenge they issue us to us, which we think is a mischaracterization of our cases, apparently how like, you know, Aniket came up and talked about how the only reason that protest movements succeeded with uh, that because of religion. But the main point we're saying is, it, Protest movements are more likely to succeed in places, and we have precedent for that, like in places in South America. It's not so much that we're talking about a necessary condition. We think that's an unfair burden for them to place on us. But we're talking about the degree to which religion actually played a huge part in that. And I'm going to talk about it in a second. But really, all opposition talks about is like three things, right? The first, and by their own standards, right? They first talk about this idea about how one of the main interests of the protest movement is overthrowing. And we think we've already won that. Opposition didn't provide any systematic mechanism through which overthrowing will happen in their case, whereas we did, right? First of all, we said that we're actually having mass appeal under our case, right? Um, the only thing that did that is that misconstrued that, oh, you know, they played around with Anikit's description of epistemic access to God and how that's important. I'll get to that in a second. But really, why is mass appeal important? Because that's what a movement is all about. It's it's about getting mass appeal. It's about the ability for people to mobilize in a meaningful way to get through. The biggest problem with movements is numbers, is strengths, which is why stuff like strength in numbers is a thing when it comes to movements, which is why stuff like the Arab Spring is huge because you have a lot of people out on the streets, which is why the same protests that happened in Latin America in the 70s and 80s against you know, right-wing dictators because of, because of slight inspiration from religious people was also important. So we think on their side of the house, the fact that they acknowledge that there are people, significant religious groups that will be, you know, and the claim that, that they're not catering to means that you lose the most important aspect of a protest movement, which is numbers. But the second thing is that we tell you that they sort of say is that, you know, we have to protect values because at the end, religious people will tend to be conservative and so on. First of all, the first goal of a protest movement, which they admit to, is sort of the idea of getting rid of the authoritarian regime, right? So we don't think that they actually apply a fair comparative, but we think they actually mischaracterize what um, protest movements are like. They, they pick the worst case scenarios, right? On the whole, if a religious group is actually siding with other secular forces in a specific group, its religious figures are being incorporated, we think the main movement is egalitarian, egalitarianism, right? And that's one of the reasons why Mexico and Uruguay are prime examples of that, is that you have uh, an anti-authoritarian sentiment in a lot of these religious groups. And the reason we win that is not just because we're sort of fighting, well, here, look at our example versus their example, but because we provide you with another mechanism, which is about how religion is itself 
in open to interpretation, something that Anik had said. Why is that crucial here? Well, because we think that there are specific versions of religious readings that specifically become salient in these instances that allow for an anti-authoritarian uh, regime. And so, so, so yeah, so generally speaking, we think that when religious figures are incorporated in these movements, they will, they are, and for the vast majority of cases doing that. But even if we get, take them at their best, we think that in an effort to have this notion of sustained values and a sustainable quasi regime with, without mass appeal, by the way, we think like you just don't end up getting rid of the authoritarian regime in the first place, right? Because you lose the initial goal that you set out to set for yourself. But okay, here's some other things that, the, that we're gonna develop um, in, the, in my rest of the speech. The first thing is that we think that uh, one of the one of the other things that you know that we're clashing on here is this notion of alienating other religious groups, right? First of all, we think we're talking about countries that are we're appealing to the majority religion, right? So the reason like places like South America, for example, or places like Pakistan, for example, is because in the vast majority of cases you have clear ideas of a majority religion. But secondly, we think that for people who want to overthrow the regime, it's on both sides of the house. The crucial feature that opposition is missing out on that we're bringing in is that it's not so much that religious people will come in and now you have a singular manifesto, but you're broadening the coalition, right? The, and this is crucial because broadening the coalition means you're expanding the range for appeal. And we think this happens all the time. I mean, think about, uh, I mean, I, I can name a few off my head, but like think about all the countries where you have national movements where parties ally with each other to get rid of a single authoritarian regime. The idea is you set a set of goals, which means that, you know, you, you have a consensus on those and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a consensus on everything else. Why does that matter here? Because we think that insofar as protest movements are concerned with overthrowing authoritarian regimes, regimes, broadening coalition doesn't mean that even in the worst case scenario, if you have, let's say, an anti-abortion sort of, you know, church, and that's kind of involved in this, this, this thing, we think that still helps because at the end of the day, you're broadening the main goal that you're trying to, uh, that you're trying to take. And it's, uh, yeah, that you're trying to have. Here's the last thing that, uh, that's really crucial here, right? That this idea about parliament and stability. So basically opposition's case rests on this notion that for, you know, um, you, once you get these people, they're going to actually take places in parliament. And because, um, you know, and that, and that at the end of the day, we have the authoritarian regime, then we get rid of that. Here's the problem with that. Aside from the fact that you don't have a mechanism for how you get rid of the authoritarian regime, we just think that opposition's living in a wonderland where people aren't religious, right? The key feature of the countries that we're talking about, the vast majority of them, is that religion does play a part. And that in the comparative, people are religious. So at the end of the day, if people demand a certain kind of policy and if the vast majority of people feel a specific way we think it's kind of bizarre for opposition to have their normative conceptions or at, you know like like some sort of constitution that they have in mind that they want at the end of the day but here's the last and most important i think one of the most important features of our case that they totally missed which is the comparative one of the key features that Anik kept telling you about is that even when you don't use these religious figures, what happens? We think we get instances like, you know, Zayal Haq in Pakistan in the 80s, where religious figures, or sorry, politicians or state leaders, specifically authoritarian ones, can co opt. A religious narrative, right? And when we think that happens, that's what we think leads to more extremist politics. That's when we think that religion gets smeared and is used in a negative sense, right? Because it's always in an authoritarian leader's interest to actually have religion in their backbone or the idea of a religious narrative because it makes a case for a certain kind of religious authority and legitimacy. When you bring in religious leaders in people who are influential for all the reasons Anikit mentioned and they didn't contest, it creates an opportunity for people for a protest movement to actually have a say and incorporate that legitimacy. So on one hand, you might have a religious leader who says, well, here's my authoritarian system. Here's why I'm a, like legitimately religiously, you finally get an opposition voice that is sympathetic to people, incorporates the masses, but finally and most crucially also has a religious narrative that because of the egalitarian nature of like a lot of these movements that we've seen actually allows for people to get, authoritarian leaders to get removed for all these reasons we'll focus. I'd like to speak very much for the speech. And now I'd like to call upon the second speaker for the opposition. Thank you. All right. So let, let, let's go with the uh, frame we were given and start on overthrowing, right? Because that is the prerequisite for a lot of these issues. First thing we have to recognize is that we do talk largely about mass appeal and it goes 
pretty un basically unresponded by the government. The first issue here with the mass appeal is the issue of heterogeneity. Now we get some argumentation here on a few things. First, we hear from op, uh, we hear from gov that most of the uh, authoritarian states we're talking about are homogeneous. First of all, this isn't true. Even in the areas that they give us, like Pakistan, you still have divides, right? Even within the Muslim community between the Shi Sunni and the Shiite. And in the more homogeneous areas, what we see is that um, if you end up aligning yourself uh, in Pakistan, probably with like the majority, you're going to end up uh, largely disenfranchising the minority, hurting these most disenfranchised groups. Uh, and because that ends up causing a lot more harm. Additionally, we get this uh, idealistic notion of like some very progressive collaborative religions working together all under one broad coalition. But this goes directly against the framing of religion that we saw from the first speaker. Because if we're to look at religion, which as it is, the one ordained truth given to these religion groups by God, then their ideology is directly opposed to notions of collaboration. They are the ones who have the truth. Other religions are false believers and heretics. We think that there's really two broad religious groups out there. We have sort of your more open, progressive, collaborative religious groups who we feel are more likely to work with our organization, work with our protest movements without us actively trying to integrate them. And we have our more conservative, less collaborative, more maybe truer to their religion groups who are just going to tear apart our broad tent and make it their own. So looking at that first group, it makes sense to have a discussion about what active integration actually looks like, which we haven't really heard anything from governments because that's what this debate's all about. And we think that active integration looks like, you know, going to churches, making concessions, listening to their speeches, and having these different religious figures be the figureheads or spokespeople of the movement. Sure, OG. If the super conservative population is 10% of the people, why would the, why would incorporating that? Got it, super got it. Okay. Yeah. Be so, the overall movement? First to which, these 10, 50% is still a significant portion of the population. It's important not to disenfranchise them. You can also look back to your arguments I told you before about how they're the most vulnerable groups. If you're now having us replace this authoritarian regime with a theocratic Shiite regime, who's going to now press the 10, 50%. I don't really consider that to be a victory. And additionally, we think that the, um, yeah, we think this sort of collaboration is going to be working. So on to the points I was actually in the middle of saying about what being active actually looks like. So we think that these concessions we're giving means that it's very, that that is the focus here of the debate. The religious groups that we actually have to actively integrate to have as a part of the organization, all the ones we're going to actually have to make promises and concessions to. So because of that, our values are going to end up being hampered. And we think that when you have to make these sort of concessions, you're going to disenfranchise these other sort of religious groups. Additionally, even in areas like Pakistan, when you have different levels, uh, or even if you have like a majority uh, I believe Sunni population, I'm not convinced that all of them are going to be okay with having the Sunni religion be the figurehead and end up uh, basically oppressing these sort of Shiites. So going down to this idea, um, and yeah, and additionally, just when we look at attempting sort of broader coalition, uh, coalition, we have to recognize that religion and government ends up trending towards authoritarianism, just by nature, again, of believing in one sole truth that they now have to force out onto other people. We explain this to you in our leader speech, and it goes, again, uncontested. So let's lastly talk about sort of comparative that were given in the previous speech about how, um, yeah, yeah, about how we can go ahead and co-opt, or if we don't co-opt religion, the authoritarian regime will. Few things. First of all, we never actually hear why the religious groups are going to want to side with us. If the authoritarians now are willing to work with these religious groups and we're trying to grab them too, in the government world, they're asking us to view a sort of race to the bottom where it's a fight of whether protesters and the authoritarians can effectively concede more to these religious groups. Uh, and it's A, a battle we're definitely not going to win because the authoritarians have much more to offer these religious groups. And B, A, we think that a more theocratic authoritarian society is even worse than the authoritarians we started with because they actually now have not only a stranglehold on the society, but they have a stranglehold that specifically excludes segments of the population. Additionally, we have this conversation about how maybe like statesmen or politicians will, and in case it comes up later around this discussion of whether the fact that religion is going to seep in eventually if we do have victory, it ends up becoming a very weird argument because the whole point of opposition that we're trying to keep out religion, at least insofar as we're making specific concessions to them. So at the end of the day, what is this case or what is this round really coming down to? 
First thing we think is coming down to is, again, whether or not we can actually end up overthrowing these groups. And it's important to realize here that not only, it's not a nearly a contest between one religion and the other religions at play. It's also a contest between the single religion and the other bodies that maybe don't feel as religious, that have more progressive tendencies, and even the other subsections within that religious group. Even the Sunnis, the Shiites in Pakistan aren't a monolith. And we can see this happening in the very example they were given to us of Poland, right? Where although Poland had a reasonable democracy, uh, of, uh, well, had, re had a reasonable democracy or a fledgling one, what we're seeing now with recent elections is that is on the verge of collapsing. We have massive protests as an extremely radical trending towards authoritarian government and Catholic church are hampering down on abortion laws, hampering down other rights, and overall trying to dismantle the government that was fought so hard for. So uh, additionally, the th main issue though that the government completely fails to encounter and that ends up being also very key for this overthrowing issue is the fact that the uh, movement becomes so much easier to demoralize once you attach to a religious figurehead. This part of it goes completely uncontested because when we start having the whole point, the reason why protests can be so hard to hamper down is because people believe in an idea. There's not any one person that the government can capture and prison and torture and kill the movement. That's why it's been so hard to take down protests in places like uh, Taiwan. But when you go ahead and connect and make a single religious figurehead, that figurehead can be captured, killed, tortured, bribed, coerced, and just as it may be easier to moralize groups of people if you center around one figure, it's also that much easier to demoralize. The strength of our protest movement lies in its decentralization. The fact that it's multiple people working towards ideas that they all share not being spoken by any one person. That's what makes it so hard for governments to defeat protests. And that's the sort of structure that we need to make sure we stick to. Thank you. I'd like to speak on March for the speech and now I'd like to call upon the third speaker for the government. One second. Sure. Starting in three, two, one. Panel, two extensions mainly for me. First off, on legitimacy and why we exclusively can bring legitimacy to these movements which need it. Secondly, in terms of um, manpower and why we can amass more people, and I will identify some mechanistic links that were missed by our opening. But before I move on to rebuttals though, note that most of these movements have the nature of being grassroots movements, right? That is to say, most of these movements start from the populations and people of uh, the general public, mostly young people, trying to amass together and trying to fight against author an authoritarian government. We don't think that they have the necessary necessary means to be, uh, continue on in, in terms of a long la in a long lasting sort of movement. and continue to establish themselves without some sort of um, established institution that is backing them, right? Um, I think that is uh, crucial in today's debate and uh, crucial for these movements' success. Okay, before I move on, several points of extraneous rebuttal. I think mo uh, uh, mainly um, OO's points are contingent on the idea of how religion will basically corrupt movements, right? I think one main thing that they pointed out is the idea that, okay, this idea of like a divine birthright of these religions will kind of transcend and like be carried into these movements. Several responses to this. One, we think that at the end of the day, they neglect the fact that these religious groups themselves actually have that impetus to join these movements, right? Why is this the case? One, in terms of on the moral level, the, there are people within these religious groups that are being oppressed by the government. They, they, um, it just, uh, they have a moral impetus to go against these authoritarian governments. But even if this is not the case, right? There's another practical level in terms of interest, right? The ways in which these uh, religions are, are able to be uh, practiced and the ways in which um, they they're a, uh, these religious figures are able to politize is very much limited by their own, very own governments because these authoritarian governments are, are what is controlling the reins and is holding everything um, it, under their control, right? At the end of the day, they have have a motivation to join these movements. What, what does this mean? Um, 
This means that a lot of the times they will not want to characterize themselves as a threat to the movement, right? They will want to also complement these movements and be part of it and um, be, be part of the movement to fight against the authoritarian governments that are a, a, a threat to these religions in the first place, right? But even if this is not the case, right? Note that at the end of the day, secondly, um, uh, uh, having a religion and believing that this uh, transcends into something that is like a divine birthright is two different things, right? Just because I identify with something and believe deeply and connect with a belief with, and, and connect with others through that belief doesn't mean that I believe that this should dominate every aspect of my life, right? I think that there's a, a clear um, missing mechanistic link. Just because we co-opt certain narratives of the religion, we don't think that this will completely dominate the movement simply because at the end of the day, the general gist of the movement will be overthrowing the authoritarian government. Um, and at the end of the day, um, this will not be completely dominated by religion, right? Okay, secondly, that, that, so the second push that we get is the idea that, okay, these movements will be easily shut down by authoritarian governments. Two responses. One, I think this is even worse on their side, right? Because there's simply no legitimacy in these movements. There's no institutional uh, power to back these people up. And many of these grassroots movements are led by young people. And uh, they are more, the, uh, more likely to be quashed by the troops and police forces of the government, right? But we think that this, uh, secondly, under our side, we have a higher chance of these movements being sustainable and carry on for the long term because of the fact that we co-opt a lot of people from a, a diverse um uh, uh, from diverse backgrounds under this religion and have different levels of political power, right? More on this later. And lastly, uh, in terms of their idea of heterogeneity, we think that uh, under their side, it's even worse because there's no way in which you can amass enough people. Note that currently a lot of movements um, are uh, again, dominated by young people and you don't get enough buy-in from people from higher levels of power. We don't think that this will necessarily be better on their side, but under our side, it's much better because you have more chances of success when you have people united around the same beliefs and people actually striving towards tangible goals, right? Okay, moving on to my substantives. In terms of my first extension, right, in terms of legitimacy, we, we think that crucially, um, no, no house has, has identified the fact that religion itself can be a, a, a factor that holds people back from joining movements, right? Why? For instance, take Islam for an example. Religious violence is not legitimate until it is sanctioned by a religious authority, right? Look at the Arab Spring. The reason why most uh, it is mostly bought in by young people rather than older people is because the older people simply don't think that this violence is um, religiously legitimate, right? But the point at which you co-opt religious narratives, right? This is the tipping point at which people will actually want to opt in. People from various different backgrounds, people from different ages, because of the fact that now it is legitimized and it is seen as something that um is um a, 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 something that will actually lead to tangible goals in terms of overthrowing the authoritarian government right we think that this is much more um weaponized under our side right but uh, secondly we think that also people uh, these uh, these uh, movements are often not seen to be legitimate because they don't have institutional backing right it is really easy to fizzle out but why having religious authority to authority on your side is uniquely beneficial is because this type of authority is so tied to people's identity and their daily life and their figment of their being right this means this the movements will be much more likely to be long lasting again this sort of analysis has been been neglected by our opening, right? So two main impacts from this. One, we establish le the legitimacy of our movement and we allow people to actually flourish in the long run. And secondly, we remove the barrier that is stopping people from opting in, especially when religious is, religion is holding them back, right? Also, in terms of my second point, in terms of manpower, right? We think that uh, we have long-term benefits for a lot of these grassroots movements because these long these movements often can't enough uh, can't, can't amass enough people because the main demographic is like young people, right? Th this they're easily quashed by the establishment, but with the religious institutions co-opted, given the large demographic that will be um, uh, will uh, that is encapsulated within these um, religions, you have different people from different levels of uh, who have different levels of political capital. We think that we have a lot more mobility in terms of having a diverse group of people along the power hierarchy to consolidate the movement. Right? We think that uh, apart from what uh, our opening identified, which is like more people in general, we get more power under our side too. And we think that at the end of the day, this is crucial in terms of having a um, 
these movements to be long lasting and to have any sort of um, chance to have success, right? So um, that's why I'm very, very proud to stand in CG. Thank you. I would like to thank the speaker very much for the speech and I would like to call upon the third speaker for the opposition. Okay, so I think we're going to win this debate in CO by first of all giving you a more accurate picture of how religion works in these countries and what specifically this integration is going to look like. I think CG, CG fall out of this debate the point of which they prove what could happen but don't actually show you the likely scenario of how religion will be played out within these movements. I think they massively underestimate who has the power to control these narratives to begin with and who has that power to dictate the narratives and decide how religion will be interpreted in these events. How does religion work in these countries? Extending on massively from our opening, because our opening have already established that these are, uh, are very religious countries, because often set within developing world authoritarian regimes, and also incredibly diverse. But it's also crucial to note that they're often very, very divided. There's often huge religious conflicts within these societies, a lot of hatred and pain between these religious groups, because they've been specifically fueled by those leaders of those authoritarian groups in order to maintain their soft power, because obviously having a divided populace is much more beneficial for you as a leader to maintain um, political support. Because how do, how do leaders specifically use religion to strengthen their power. This goes on much further from our opening when they just say, they say they're appointed by God. I think it's true that they specifically frame themselves as appointed by God, but also protectors of the faith. And they are appointed by this higher power, not just to carry out their role as government, but also protect the faith. There are five mechanisms how they do this, descending from our opening. One, they specifically frame their often their political party or their agenda around their like an ideology, which is often religious. Therefore, religion and the state becomes inseparable. Therefore, if you're against um, this particular um, leader, you are also against the religion that they stand to protect and the religion they represent. Two, they often recruit the military based off religious faiths. They say that, hey, they, they use a narrative that they are not only defenders of the state, but defenders of the faith. They have this commonality between them and this shared purpose that is much higher than themselves and any form of political values. Three, they often pay a lot of religious elite, religious members through things like private privileges in order to get them to vocalize their support and often stand behind these leaders to begin with. They often use their private benefits or their like policies to privilege certain individuals and say, if you back my um, if you back my regime, I will also um, help you as a religious leader, it's like share your influence, which often means they have a lot of support and vocalized support from the most powerful people of these religious groups. Four, finally, they do lots of divide and conquer rules within their own populace, which in order to fuel resentment between these di different sectors. Because the minority groups aren't just oppressed, like OG talk about, but they're also really actively demonized. These repressed minority groups are specifically framed as being an attack on other people's faith. They're shown as people that want to have power, are power hungry, and because they want to impose their religious beliefs onto the rest of the populace. They're not just people who have different beliefs to you, but they are an active threat against your religious beliefs. And if they ever had power, and if they ever maintain their power, they would directly entrench on your rights as an individual. This is specifically how leaders are able to justify very oppressive pop 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 policies against minority groups by framing them as attacks on the faith and also claiming legitimacy on God. Therefore, why is this bad for political movements? I think political movements within authoritarian regimes have two main obstacles they need to overcome. I think one is internal divisions because obviously having a divided of um, a divided group within yourself just means you are less powerful as an opposition, but also to a united opposition is probably a massive thing. The point is you have a military that actively backs that leader and the elites that have a quite united front against you means it's much more harder for you to gain momentum and gain any sort of leverage and leeway. Therefore, why is it bad the point in which you introduce religious leaders? Because I agree, you are going to get some buy it, as OG talk about, from those that buy into the faith, but you're also gonna go, it's also going to come at the cost of a huge turn away from most everyone that doesn't buy into the faith. Because I said before, these often these different religions aren't just portrayed as different, but things that have been actively against you and against your religious beliefs as a person because of these years of divide and rule conquest. And also I think when you actively integrate religious leaders, you frame this protest as a religious protest rather than just like a uh, trench on human rights. Because you're saying that we gain legitimacy from this unique religion, therefore it's only framed within that one religion's benefits. Therefore, those that are unrepresented by that religion or specifically and perhaps more crucially feel that religion is an attack on their own religious beliefs will inevitably be turned away. I think also, especially within the context of these countries, religion is a hugely important part of people's identity and their life. I think it's probably more important than perhaps even democratic values where, especially with like places outside 
of the West um, look like democratic values just aren't as entrenched in their social values. I think religion will take the forefront in these scenarios. Therefore, I think it's also important to know what type of religious leaders these guys probably act probably actually looks like and what kind of leaders they'll probably be able to integrate, which I asked in a POI. Because I think it's just one very unlikely you're going to integrate um, religious leaders that support the government or the, that are part of the religion that the government claims to protect. Why? Because often these leaders are specifically co-opted by the government through things like private privileges in order to gain, gain their support and power. I think also these particular leaders have a lot to lose, but they have a lot of privileges and rights to lose by necessarily turning away from their government, especially an oppressive government where turning away from them could actually cost them their lives. I think if you are going to get any sort of religious leaders from that religion, they're going to be much lesser, um, lesser leaders that, like in the face of a much higher authority um, standing against them, probably are going to have much minimal impact there's no point in getting like one priest um from like to, to stand out against the catholic um government if the pope is like supporting it as an example i think this has very little impact what i think is more likely to happen though is therefore you get um religious leaders from those minority religious groups to begin with they have far less to lose they have far less at stake and they're probably more negatively affected by that government and have a greater incentive in order to take that government down to begin with therefore why is this a bad thing i think it specifically strengthens the narrative that the authority authoritarian regimes used in order to have maintain soft power to begin with because now again and this is why CG like can't really get their harm, can't get their benefits to begin with about how like um, you claim legitimacy through religion. Because I don't think it's these small um, protest movements that control the narratives. Specifically, the leader that will say, "Look, this minority group is now being who they have actively demonized and not just oppressed." They are saying, "Look, they are attacking us as a faith." Because again, because they linked their government specifically to the faith, they're saying an attack on us is attack on the faith. So the leaders are specifically able to often depersonalize these protests and say, "Look, they're not attacking my government, they're not attacking my policies, but they're." attacking me because of my religious beliefs and how I want to protect our faith. And specifically the point in which they have religious leaders they can point at, I think this becomes far, far worse far easier to do so on this side of the house. I think it's important to know who controls the narrative. It's not these religious, um, like individual religious leaders, but specifically governments who have one media control or two have the buy-in of lots of elites that will be willing to vocalize their support, especially when those elites often come from high religious establishments. Therefore, I think the impacts of this is probably threefold. I think when you three, one probably get more likely that those elite religious leaders will more likely vocalize their support in power of the government, which will fuel further like dissension. So all their followers be like, um, no, we actually support this government to begin with. And this this actually is an attack on our faith. And probably also like to do things like donate resources and uh, money for these governments in order to help them. I think too, you also get a more united military, the point of which they, are, they have a more common goal to attack. They're not attacking their neighbors who want greater human rights. They're attacking those that want to attack their faith, the faith that they have been designed to defend. And therefore they have a much more shared common goal um, that goes beyond the individual self. I think the point of which this probably looks like things like greater repression of um, peaceful protests and far greater military impact. I think finally you just get a more divided protest, the point at which you're never going to get full buy-in from the population, the point at which you in, like introduce religious divide. I think it's probably bad because you get less banned power and just a far less um, effective protest. So for all those reasons, perhaps we're closed. I like thank speaker very much for the speech and now I'd like to call upon the last speaker for the government. Uh, yeah, just one moment. Starting in three, two, one. Panel, we see through examples of people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we see through examples of Jenna, we see through examples of Gandhi, that the sheer power that religious institutions and religious leadership through its sheer magnitude of having support and buy-in can, can grant these movements success. We show you better than any other team does why we managed to get success for these movements and why we managed to oppose ourselves to authoritarian regimes. First, I'm gonna give you some examples of like how, um, what is it, of how like the other teams haven't meaningfully engaged with our extension. And then I'm gonna go away team by team as you do with a web speech. So first of all, no team is meaningfully engaged with our with like like our point on manpower, organization, and resources. Rachel showed you very clearly how engaging with these religious institutions and religious movements will give you greater amounts of manpower to the tipping point where you can actually overthrow these regimes. And the fact that like all the division arguments that were put forth by CO don't necessarily manifest in the way that they characterize them. We're gonna recharacterize this in a moment. We always we also showed you how like organization works in these movements and how organization is more able to happen within like the framework of religious institutions institutions where like they are more of a basis for organization as compared to like other sort of very, very diverse movements that you kind of have in trying to overthrow authoritarian regimes. And we also talked to you about resources, which is something that nobody managed to touch. So now let's look at the best case that we have. In the best, in the best case that like the 
opposition teams gave you, we still win because we still have the pluralism amongst religious groups because these groups have greater incentives to want to coexist than they do to want to exterminate and kill each other and mobilize the state against one another because they know that the numbers just aren't on their side to help them target one another and that the people will still be like their religious institutions will still be oppressed under such a status quo. So they won't be willing to take that chance. First, let's weigh against closing. Closing's main argument is that like religion is used like a political tool, religion is used as a political tool to claim legitimacy over the state. So what's wrong with this argument? First of all, fundamentally, it isn't necessarily true since these groups often have common incentives. For instance, like even in Pakistan, which is like a much used example of this debate, people don't necessarily vote on religious grounds because even within religion, there is enough diversity of political interest for them to want to divulge. So what does this mean? This means that there would be like, if you can incline people to converge on a common interest, this doesn't necessarily mean mean that there's enough sort of commonality for the kind of oppression and the kind of harms that CEO tell you to exist. So what does this mean? This means, first of all, that these like these states don't usually have a single majority large enough to have a monopoly on state power and claim any of the harms that like CEO give you about like military and like sort of state convergence on power and narratives to actually manifest. But even if they did, the competing institutions who aren't a majority, these other religions are still larger because like this, like this majority isn't big enough to be decisive. So how what happens? as a result. What happens as a result is that they can mobilize to such a large tipping point of people that they will not succeed in the kind of narrative control that you're talking about. First of all, the state won't buy it in the first place because they're not big enough. And second, even if it's like some case scenario where they did, they can't mobilize the military against them because there's just so many of them in swathes that are divided across so many points that they'd be significantly overwhelmed by the sheer number and scale of these people. So they cannot succeed. And in the best case, and like in the worst case scenario, none of these benefits actually manifest. So we win anyway. So why is this better than the best fits. So we show you that these divisions don't necessarily exist between like like to the point where like they would not be willing enough to engage with other religious institutions. And I'm gonna come on to that when I take way against opening because opening talk more about that. So it, like even in the best case scenario that they give us about like religious institutions having some kind of monopoly on state power and state narratives, we still win. So that's way against opening here. First of all, it's worth noting that we break the deadlock on opening half about like overthrowing and whether or not it su succeeds. Because opening, opening teams couldn't decide like, would you isolate or put off competing and other religious groups? We answered this. We don't put them off because they have a common interest because these movements are probably being suppressed at some level or like not being suppressed more. Like for instance, look at Nazi Germany and the fact that like different sects of religions like that different sects of like Christianity were suppressed first before like Catholicism was eventually suppressed because there was enough conflict happening there. Look at the fact that like eventually like the religious monopoly power that happened with Zia al in Pakistan eventually fell apart because there was so much conflict happening there. Like ultimately there's so much like these groups who are being suppressed disproportionately to other groups as soon as they're united in their suppression they have a common incentive to engage in struggle against authoritarian rule and resist it in a meaningful way because they can like care more they care more about their survival and their religious and political capital remaining intact than they do about the legitimacy of these other movements they can't spread the word of god if their mosques are shut down and their bibles are being burned now the second point about this like this uh, deadlock this overthrowing happened we show you yes it does because these groups are probably being suppressed to some extent like 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 i said earlier like zell explained with religious groups like the Jamaat Islami due to like theological disagreements and opposition to his actions. We show you that like Rachel showed you clear tipping point analysis as to why without the sheer number of movement, like sheer numbers that you get in the movement as a result of religious buy-in, this will not happen. Why is this? First of all, manpower, because these religious like institutions usually have such a hold over the population that the majority is religious to at least some extent. And that without the sort of like hold back that you have on legitimacy, without having them buy in in the first place, that you won't get enough support to overthrow them in the first place. So any of the harms that OO give you are like meaningless anyway. And the second thing is the resources of political communities. Like of religious communities rather. Like look at Martin Luther King and look at like the sheer amount of like power that like medics would have or the fact that you have so many people that you can have mass resistance on an economic level and on civil disobedience levels. The result of this is that ultimately what happens is that there is enough manpower and enough sort of resource buy-in for there to be able to be a meaningful counter to the state. This counter does not exist without the legitimacy of religious institutions. So it does not exist for opposition. So opposition said like this like whole thing about like it being bad for succession because these movements are seeking political capital at any given point and will probably existing governments are taking too much power. I'll tell you what's wrong with it, but first I, I, like if opening have anything. Three, two, 
one, okay, let's move on. So what's wrong with this? They don't analyze why religious groups want to get involved. Rachel tells you very clearly that they won't be the centerpiece of the movement. Divine birthright won't necessarily be a controlling force. We're co-opting narratives of religion. We're not making this a religious protest. So what happens as a result? People may be a religion, but they don't necessarily want theocracies because like, they're simply buying into the fact that they're fighting an illegitimate regime. So the best case where this like argument from OO is true, religious institutions don't necessarily want autocracy or theocracy because they think they'll need to make them need to make compromises to have success in the political spheres. And religious institutions, since they have like the epistemic value that OG talked about, they won't want to dilute. And the worst case, this isn't true at all. And we see religious institutions well proper protest movements anyway, because they're usually being suppressed in the status quo. We tell you that religious movements have clear incentives on moral grounds and political grounds, because even against their best case, we show you why they won't just want to cop political capital, but they'll want to get involved. This helps vulnerable people and oppressed faiths in significant ways where they're not able to participate. And like, they won't be able to like engage in the struggle anyway because they're being oppressed to such an extent and they won't be demoralized if they take out a leader because like martyrdom man okay now let's go like way up against the bench real quick so they look like they went on the manpower argument however note they can't access any of these benefits except for our analysis because we materialize how conservatives buy in how we access a larger and greater amount of resources and a greater amount of political capital because of all of these people all over the spectrum of political capital and diversity that you have within religious movements look at white people and the world that they had in like swinging support for martin luther king and for like black movements in the 1960s for all those reasons oppose i like to thank you very much for the speech and i'd like to call upon the last speaker for the opposition all right can you hear me okay uh yes we can Brilliant. Three things in this speech. First of all, a holistic overview of the debate, where a case falls within it, and how you should judge it. Second of all, dismantling God's individual cases even further beyond what we we're going to do initially. And thirdly, if I have time, specifically weighing against OO. Let's talk about this debate then, right? So I think what's really important to note is that all of the scenes in this debate talk generally about the impact on the protest group, like its size, its efficacy, etc. This is fine, but this is only one half of the coin, because we tell you that this protest group always exists in contrast to something else, which is the authoritarian regime, right? It exists to counter it, the regime exists to counter it, the group, etc. So I think to whatever extent the protest group can get stronger, that's fine, but it only works so as long as they are stronger in proportion to the regime. Okay. So I think that you always need to be considering with like like regardless of what happens to the protest group and its size, how does that also impact uh, the size and power of the authoritarian regime? I think at the point at which we engage with this, we probably win this debate, right? Why do we think this is? Why do we think that the increase that we tell you that you get um, in the power of the authoritarian regime is disproportionate to any increase that you may get in the resources and power of the um, uh, protest group, even if everything that Gov tells you is true. I think a couple, uh, I think a couple of reasons. One, that the resource gap in terms of how many resources uh, the uh, two have, right? So that the people who you're more likely to be recruiting to the protest group are likely to be more impoverished. Um, because specifically because they are people who have not been benefited by the state, but the people who are benefited by the state the most, i.e. the wealthiest people, are more likely to be uh, in the pocket of the government. I think at the point at which these people believe that there's a kind of existential threat to their religion, something I'm going to tell you a bit more about later on, this is when uh, they're more likely to do things like, you know, donating to the, the military, the government, etc., brought back providing more resources behind them and using their like media empires or whatever to recruit more people. I think there's a disparity in this. Second of all, even if you don't buy that, even if we assume that there are equal resources on both sides, I'll take a POI later, uh, note that leaders uh, stay in power by co-opting the majority narrative anyway, right? Because that's the best way to do it. If you can have the majority narrative, or at least the majority of the narratives, then you're more able to stay in power. It's just kind of common sense, uh, whether that's by divine right of kings or some other mechanism. So I think to whatever extent you get active engagement increasing in the protest group uh, and, and, and support there, I think that support increases in the regime more because they are seeing either one, an enemy religion, if it's a different religion, or two, blasphemy, if it, is, if, it is, if it is a different interpretation of the same religion. So not only do you get this sort of existential threat to their religion, which is more important than anything in the mortal plane, because it affects them for an eternity going onwards in the afterlife, but it also depersonalizes everyone else, with everyone else is just like evil in the eyes of this religion. So I think it angers people, it turns people away from the um, protest group and towards this regime, uh, because of this like monopoly on your know, religious media, et cetera, uh, that is had, and also because just like that's what the majority uh, religion uh, looks like. You know, the kinds of people you're going to be recruiting to this regime are probably people who weren't agreeing with the state uh, anyway, because if they were agreeing with the state anyway, then you're obviously not going to be able to get them uh, on side. Um, okay, 
let's talk a bit about the rebuttal when we get to it. Because I think we get get told essentially uh, a couple of things you're, uh, around you. It's not true, and there is some kind of diversity uh, within these groups. I think what's more to note here is that there's still going to be some majority uh, or some sort of largest group, right? And I think that even if you don't buy that, uh, note that whenever you introduce some kind of antagonistic religion, this is what causes splintering, right? It doesn't matter to what extent you put commonality of religions or united religions beforehand. I think at the point at which you introduce an enemy, um, that's when that that that's when you so so you've got disparate disparate religions beforehand. At the point at which you introduce one antagonistic religion that is out to get everyone else, which is how this is framed, I think everyone else is more able to unite and get behind it, right? I think this isn't about like diversity as um, CG tries to tell you our case is. That's the OO case. This is about conflict and the extent to which these groups are able to be in conflict or unite with each other. Until they're more able to unite against these protest groups uh, when uh, you know, the, the, the motion happens. Uh, additionally, we just don't get any mechanistic analysis, right? You know, we give you like four or five mechanisms as to how militaries are able to construct their narrative to be ideologically more supportive than what this actually means. They haven't engaged with any of these. This looks like the party framing, it, framing their beliefs around the, their ideology. It looks like recruitment to the military. It looks like private privileges being given to religious leaders. It looks like the divide and conquer policies and no engagement on any of that. Um, so I think ultimately we win this debate because uh, we tell you why the sort of the side of the scales that no one else engages with is actually the more important side of the scales uh, to consider in this sort of delicate balance of power between the authoritarian regime and the protest group. I'll take opening. Why is your case of a majority oppressing the minority more likely than the case of Soviet countries where the majority is oppressed? And in these countries where religion is key, why are democratic values on your side sufficient for a successful protest movement? Right. I think a couple of things. I think one note that there is still the gap in terms of wealth and power. So like uh, power that you have over the media, power that you have in terms of resources, which I think happens regardless of whether it's a majority or minority in terms of the population. It's still a majority or minority uh, in ter majority like leading in terms of the resources and the capital. So at the point at which we also have a mechanism relating to that, I think that we can still stand even in these instances uh, that, that you're talking about as well. Okay, let's talk a bit more about Gov specifically, right? Because they, they try to tell you that you get more people on side at the point at which you have um, religious uh, people backing them. Um, I think we're going to show that this is pretty mitigatory. Uh, why? Because I think one, note that there's the wealth gap, which I've already talked about a fair bit. Two, note that uh, the people who are probably going to be likely to join these groups uh, would have been supported, supportive of them anyway, right? Because you already have to disagree with the state in some way to even consider joining these groups. So I think these are probably the kinds of people who are still going to like direct people to these groups. They might give some kind of backing to these uh, groups uh, already. They might uh, or already, and their followers are already. So, so the people who are already listening to these religious leaders, i.e. their followers, might be are probably going to be reached by the group either way. The difference then is whether or not uh, we platform them, we accept them, we integrate them into uh, our protest groups. And I think that that's when we tell you that you cause active harms because you synonymize the group with the religion as opposed to the religion just being one backer amongst many uh, and, and anyone else. I think this also beats the CG case, right? Why? Because one note that they, when they tell you that people are held back from joining these uh, groups by their religious beliefs, I think we tell you that you can still encourage joining without actively uh, making this group part, part of your uh, religion. That your religious leaders are still likely to encourage uh, the, the ones who would have joined this group anywhere are still likely to encourage joining it we just don't have to platform them in return or integrate them i think that this is probably the main thing that cg has the only other thing that they have is the resource manpower stuff which one is sort of the roots of the og second of all again we give you the uh, weighing in terms of like the wealthiest elites uh, and thirdly even if that's not the case we give you all, all the other stuff that i talked about earlier um very briefly then on og uh, i i think we beat og because OG tells you one about corrupting the movements. I think this is dependent on the movements actually winning in the first place. So it's kind of secondary to us. Two, they tell you about putting off people from other religions. I think that uh, one, we give better mechanisms uh, for what happens on the side of the scale to the protest movements at the point at which we tell you about the symmetry in OG. Second of all, we just engage uniquely on the other side of the scales, which is more important anyway. So we have to beat them in that regard. Uh, CEO, thank you. I'd like to thank the speaker very much uh, for the speech and everyone for this debate. Please, if speakers could leave the room so we can adjudicate. Uh, and uh, if you could stop streaming.